I am joined today by Dr. Tamsin Lewis, MD. She qualified with honors in medicine and surgery at King's College London in 2004 and was awarded MRC Psych from Royal College of Psychiatrists in 2009. After years of training in the conventional medical paradigm, Tamsin became disillusioned with the Band-Aid approach and pharmaceutical dogma which pervaded daily practice in primary and secondary care. Building on ideas of expert functional medical doctors, Tamsin began analyzing her own blood work and measuring specific biomarkers in order to build a picture of personal health from the ground up. During this time, she began competing in triathlons and found her performance improved in direct correlation with the degree to which she optimized key biomarkers through lifestyle, nutrition, supplement, and training adjustments. Tamsin spent four years as an elite endurance athlete, and in 2014, she won Ironman UK as a professional in her first attempt at the distance, having never run a marathon prior. And her raison d'être is to empower people to redefine the way they think about their health. Tamsin, really appreciate you taking the time out today. Hi, nice to be here, Mark. Thanks for the intro. No worries. Well, listen, can we perhaps start by um, you telling the listeners a little bit more about how you got into medicine and endurance sport? Sure. I mean, they're very different categories, I guess. So yeah. um, how did I get into medicine? I always uh, I grew up wanting to change the world. You know, I was that, that aspirational youth who thought um, that you could fix things by... Yeah, Moving, moving lots of things around. Um, so I was all the aspirational youth, and there was no medical, um, there was no sort of medical leads in my family, as it were. So it just became something I became passionate about. Got the relevant grades, and then got into med school, and just found it um, all fascinating from the start until I actually got into clinical practice, and I started to realise that it was all, it, a lot of it was focused on on medication and. I actually really enjoyed pharmacology at the time. Um, I was very good at it, but I think um, in hindsight, it wasn't. <laughs> it, it gave me a layering of knowledge, but it certainly is something that I, I don't uh, aspire to to use much um, use much of my daily practice now. So, medicine for me was always just understanding more about the human body and the mind and the interplay between the two. And as I progressed in medical practice, I realised that I actually got more time to spend with people when I was doing psychiatry, which was mental health. And I actually was allowed to sort of, you know, really understand why people were presenting with the the mental health problem they were and, and, and discover some of the physical issues associated. So I actually sort of went off and, and, and did postgraduate qualification in psychiatry. Um, and then after a few years, I realized that actually, you know, I had to um, be part of a system, the NHS, which was at that time very much constrained to practicing within a pharmaceutical model of psychiatric practice. And every time I tried to venture outside that to, you know, to encourage lifestyle change or dietary change and supplement change, it was it was seen as practicing off piece and wasn't encouraged. So I ended up leaving that um, two years ago now, um, and became more interested in performance, sports medicine, um, and uh, endocrinology, actually. Um, and through my time as a professional athlete, which I'm, we'll touch on, obviously, I became interested in how you could modulate your performance through tracking various biomarkers. Um, and, yeah, started, I set up my own company, which tracked various blood tests for various, you know, demographics of people, um, in 2012 and I've kind of gone from there really and now I have a team that I'm working with who um, essentially a functional and integrative medical team um, so that's how, that's how I spend my days currently that's fantastic and we'll definitely circle back to the medical side of things but if you can yeah jump in first on the athletic side you know when did you get into endurance training was it something you were always doing as you grew up and at what point did you kind of kick things up into that more elite um, amateur and professional ranks yeah, sure. So I wasn't, um, I was always a natural athlete, but never did a huge amount of sports when I was younger. Um, I grew up around a dad who was a professional cyclist. So I became very aware of the amount of time one needed to spend training in order to be good at something. Um, so my dad was, yeah, like a Tour de France level cyclist in, wow. in, the, old, in the old days uh, and used to regale us with just crazy stories of, of you know, vast mileage and taking salted kippers for breakfast and being restricted for fluid for five hours. Espressos and Rattlers. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and whiskey's on the side of the road to null the pain and that kind of thing. So um, it was there was I was saw a lot of hardship and a lot of pain in cycling, but a lot of uh, glory as well. So it was kind of the, the paradox between the two. Um, I so I was fairly good at school, and then um, unfortunately to, went through that period of my life where I had. Um, I, I, I want, it was an eating disorder for all intents and purposes that di- diagnosed as such, but it was more, you know, there were the family problems, interpersonal problems, and I decided that I wasn't going to eat much for a while and um, ended up in quite a bad way, and that meant that I wasn't able to exercise, or I was told not to exercise for quite a while, but managed to pull myself out through that and became more focused on, you know, food as nourishment and allowing me to do what what I wanted to do which was um, be sporty be athletic and so I started doing a bit more when I was at med school discovered I was quite good at it so I had a uh, must have a genetic predisposition for endurance and um, I won the world amateur triathlon championships um, after being in the sport for about well just over a year and from that got some sponsorship and picked up by a coach who said you should really look at this a bit more seriously Uh, (laughs) after only a year that's phenomenal and in those early days were you was it the sort of classic nutrition around endurance athletes and you know more of the carb dominant diet and and, and you know sugar packs during training that type of thing or yeah I do think and even as you know with a medical background even though we don't get taught much nutrition I, I really was you know somewhat clueless around nutrition and it was all carbohydrate focused and glycogen storing and and, um, you know your classic um, sports drinks and yeah so I I developed a number of gut problems as many athletes do from that because you know you're just throwing a lot of carbohydrate down the gut that isn't prepared for it but yes yeah, so um, I think for me given that I had that background of um, restriction I think you know I, and I discuss this with um Mike Mutzel actually over on a podcast a while ago, we were looking at, you know, people that have a history of an eating disorder, particularly like anorexia, where they've gone for prolonged periods of not eating. Um, your mitochondria become particularly good at dealing with that. Um, so on, on, on some level, that becomes a performance advantage for endurance athletes who do have that history because they become very mitochondrial efficient so I found that when I started doing more endurance sport that I could burn you know I could go for longer periods than my peers without having to have carbohydrate wow interesting it is but then you use the caveat that okay (laughs) when you do that you tap you know you have to work your adrenals fairly hard because uh, you know cortisol production goes up and then that comes with its uh its own problems so I what I learned was that you can have a genetic predisposition to having, you know, good mitochondria, good solid mitochondria, and but if you don't refuel appropriately, then you know you, the catabolic breakdown state does predominate. So I learned to to support myself enough, but um, um, also be careful that you know if I didn't, and because it was easy for me not to, then I would become ill or my immunity would you know my immunity would drop or I wouldn't adapt or recover from training so it was quite a, it was quite a an interesting journey absolutely and I mean you've touched on a, a number of great um, areas there the, the first being digestion that's definitely you know I recently had Dr. Tommy Wood on and he was talking about the athlete gut and of course what we see and as you've mentioned there you know um, GI distress um, gas bloating discomfort um, hyperpermeability we see as well so you know what type of things did you find were effective for yourself in terms of helping to kind of correct any of that kind of dysfunction or with, with folks that you're seeing uh, that you were training with? So I have had all that for a long period of time and, and that loads of athletes did. We just didn't know what to do about it. And I, you know, if I knew now what I, what I, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have been a better athlete because, you know, I just coexisted with gut problems for a number of years and it wasn't until I changed up my diet and, reduced the fermentable carbohydrates added in more quality fats that my gut was better but you know I did the classic endurance athlete thing of you know taking an acid blocker before races to prevent the acidity that would come from all the excess sugar 
I took charcoal on the bike to prevent the gas that I would was going to get and then I took busk pan on the run to prevent the spasms so it was very much a mitigating damage response as opposed to what I do now which is more you know try and work out why you've got so much gas floating in hyperpermeability um, and that's what I do with clients you know we we'd look at the gut test now and we'll look at the you know the, the balance of the microbiome and we'll look at the parasites that are present and and the gut immunity and, and, and fix that accordingly but at the time I wasn't aware of all that and having done my own testing since and known found out that I'm harboring three different parasites um, I've had to go on my own journey of, of, of trying to to get rid of those but they're they're more common having done a lot of this testing now they're more common in athletes than otherwise you'd appreciate and people just put up and shut up you know they go for low level grumbling gut problems for a number, a number of years but oh, for sure. a lot of a lot of triathletes, sorry, do, um, you know, we put ourselves in disgusting waters, you know, we drink from fountains in the middle of the Alps, you know, it's, um, our exposure to pathogens is, is high, and then you have the, you know, the exercise stress on the gut, and you have a sort of recipe for these opportunistic bugs taking hold. 100%, I mean, it's definitely something that, um, you know, obviously helps you in your practice, I'm sure now, having gone through that and experienced all that, and and being able to now tailor for folks how they can fuel themselves during, you know, long rides or, or triathlons, et cetera. Now, as we shift over to, you know, training stress, which you mentioned, you know, is there, you know, in terms of the impact on yourself versus, you know, was it training loads and nutrition or, or for females in general, let's say in terms of endurance training, what are, what are some of the things um, to be mindful of uh, that, that can lead into that sort of from overreaching into that overtraining? Yeah, absolutely. I think, what happens in training groups often just to start with that because this is my experience of training with an elite group and I trained with Nicholas Spirig who was a former Olympic champion um, you know and some other Ironman winners Chrissy Wellington for example and we were coached by Brett Sutton and, and he was what he was very good at is looking at people and saying you do that type of training you do that you do that so he wouldn't put women um, the, the, no two women in the same situation of of training because you believe that they need a different stimulus to get a different adaptation from the training so for me that was quite eye-opening because I often before that it was just you do this you know the other lady does this and you'll if you do all that to plan you'll get the same response so I learned that a personalized approach was was important and that some people could withstand more training loads than others and I think people get very caught up in endurance sport with doing a number of hours to achieve you know just to, just for the sake of doing it, for sure, yeah, than, yeah. And it was a bit eye-opening for me that I had to do less than some of my peers, and I would perform better. So you know, there were the your diesel engines who would do loads of hours, steady state aerobic activity, and they would adapt and do well from that. But for me, I needed less long, slow, steady, probably because I had efficient mitochondria, uh, and more of the the strength and high intensity work, which would push up my aerobic threshold. So what I learned from that is that, you know, probably um, one of the re yeah, um, training load is personalized, as we know, and it, that depends on your relationship with your coach as well. And obviously how you how much you how much self-reflection you have. Um, so know how much you can you can take. But, you know, eating enough for for female athletes is often very difficult, specifically in sports that require leanness and low body fat and if you're doing you know 16 to 30 hours training a week it sometimes is difficult to meet those caloric demands specifically if you've got you know uh, restrictions on your diet so a lot of people are now going high fat low carb and as you, we all know with the pitfall with that is just that people don't eat enough um, cal calories especially in endurance sport and especially women and especially women with digestive issues because they can't digest the fat um, 100 so percent. I mean there's definitely I mean what you mentioned before about the diesel engine is a really great take home because I know a lot of uh, people that I see in Toronto who are amateur um, endurance and, and elite amateur endurance it's always that idea of trying to do more and trying to get that mileage and and, and keep up with the group and just what you mentioned there having that real personalized approach is, is so crucial to the whole piece and of course you know, circling back to eating enough and caloric demands. And it's difficult, isn't it, when we're trying to shift this in terms of 
moderating carbohydrate intake, but still managing the the total caloric intake. And of course, the female triad is something that is you know is quite common in endurance sport. Can you can you speak to um, to that and and the frequency of that and in your experience here? Um. Uh, yeah, I, I can, and I know that the female triad is, is sort of um, evolved to a more what they call reds. I think have you read about that relative, relative energy deficiency syndrome? Yeah. Because we realise that it's a, you know, it's a it's a spectrum of of symptomatology. So people can get HPA axis dysfunction and lose lose their periods, but they might not necessarily have, you know, low bone density or uh, low BMI. Hundred um, percent. So we know that. that that, 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 that there is a spectrum um but it, it's becoming in, increasingly common you know it, most um i think you are the exception if you have periods as an as an elite endurance athlete you know it's uh and if you do have them they're usually irregular or they're very heavy um or you're on the pill and it's just not you just don't think about it or the marina coil or something like that so um it's a very fine balance and you know there used to be this pre um this predominance in, in 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 scientific thinking that it was all dependent on body fat and i know you know uh, trent stellingworth's work and his wife's work as they've moved away from thinking that you know um cessation or irregularity of periods is directly linked to to body fat it's more about your body's perception of safety so caloric demand so how stressed is are you how stressed is your body is it how how much stress is your body perceiving it to be in um so that's what i came across you know for these for example some women would be very lean yet still retain periods and those are the people that i became completely you know fascinated by because i went what are you doing for sure to be so robust <laughs> and you know nicola spirig was one of those women as an olympic champion and she was this kind of really rock solid well she is sorry a rock solid psychologically you know from a psychological perspective she's she's rock solid she has a number of a lot of pillars of her life very strong and her kind of stress perception appeared quite low you know she'd buffer a lot of um of, of, of environmental stress for want of a better word so um you know so what i learned from that without waffling on is that um you know Body weight per se does not determine presence or lack of periods. You know, people can be lean as you like and still have periods. But how you deal with stress, what is your cumulative stress load? So that includes training stress, relationship stress, lack of food stress, um, you know, work stress, any any other stressor will have an effect on the HPA axis and therefore cessation of periods. Um, so the other aspects of the, the triad that we should touch on are, you know, the lower bo low bone density, which we know is directly related to lower hormone levels. And we, you know, we used to think that that was because of, um, you know, we put people on the pill and, and their bone would just be protected by the estrogen in the pill. But we now know that that's actually not the case. Um, so it, it, it is a big deal. You know, we've got these legion of athletes who have suboptimal bone density and that is related to nutritional status not just uh, you know hormone status it's related to you know cortisol production other glucocorticoid production in the body which is bone negative catabolic state um, and it's also related to you know calcium vitamin d boron other other micronutrients so you know a takeaway from that is the body can put up with stress for a, you know a, a finite period of time and depending on how well you support it you know from a macro and a micronutrient status it will buffer that stress but the people I see are the people that have been this chronic endurance athletes for a number of years they may have been on the pill they may not may have irregular periods for a number of years their body weight fluctuates depending on the season um, and you know those are the people that, that go borderline osteoporotic and as they proceed into their late 30s early 40s and they you know the hormone levels drop even further when they go into the perimenopause that's when we start seeing problems and that's when bone uh reaccrual becomes more difficult so bone density has dropped and that's when it becomes harder to uh to gain it back so i tell people to you know be proactive in their approach and 
um, you, you know, monitor your hormones if, if you know, monitor certain biomarkers, cortisol um, and hormone markers just to see where you're at and get a good feel for whether you're doing yourself damage. Fantastic insights. And, and before we sort of jump into some of these key biomarkers to manage, like a couple of things I just wanted to jump back to there. You mentioned uh, obviously caloric intake being key and nutrient density. You know, what were some of the strategies for you to make sure that you were, you know, eating enough or achieving those uh, micro macro requirements that you needed? I think you, it, personal insight is in and um, awareness is important. So I knew that I wouldn't, I'd feel tired. I wouldn't be able to perform well the next day. My sleep was disrupted. I'd wake up hungry in the night. That was a key one for me, knowing that I hadn't refueled enough. Um, but, you know, it's difficult if you've got a subpar digestion. Um, you know, eating enough and knowing when you've eaten enough is important, is, is difficult, specifically when we became more interested about around this kind of um, strategic use the carbohydrates so you do, when you do fasted runs you know you then have a whole period of time when you you know haven't haven't eaten enough um and so for you have to put those calories back in, in in at some point of the day but definitely it depends it depends on person to person but for me it was becoming is that you or me sorry I'll turn that off it was um becoming more aware of um of actually just taking on more fuel on my longer rides for example um and you know fueling after training it's definitely uh, what you mentioned there about just being hungry at night or hungry all the time it's something i see with athletes as well just you know they're walking home and all of a sudden the convenience store they just nail a whole bag of licorice or candy bars or something that just their body just says enough is enough and they get these strong cravings for sugars and that's definitely one of those flags that i see for people having to to refuel a little bit more um and of course, I used to get that, but I remember thinking I, I used to crave cheese. Oh, yeah. um, like, like I was out on a bike ride and I'd go into a garage and eat like a block of cheese. I'm thinking this is strange. <laughs> um, but Brett Sutton used to encourage things like that. He was a he was a high fat guy, so he's like, right, slab of you know Swiss milk chocolate or dark chocolate, whatever, or block of cheese. He was uh, go for it, right? But you have to listen to your body and what it. But you know. Uh, <laughs> if you listen to your body too much you know the easy option there is like just get the calories in and that might you know that can be but um a lot of athletes are psychologically tough enough to be able to delay gratification and uh to to a later stage but i don't know you have to be aware as you said for sure and, and the other one that i noticed a lot is when athletes start doing a fasted run and they just notice how well they feel in terms of digestive function that normally cues up this idea of okay maybe we do need to to, to change some strategies or get into some nutritional periodization um, rather than just the, the sort of classic approach. Now, you, you also touched yeah. on stress there uh, and kind of dealing with stress and this, the psychology behind it, which I find really fascinating because obviously a lot of type A personalities, and while we always associate type A with sort of the very competitive and the positive aspects, I mean, some of the other aspects of a type A personality, which is sort of that constant sense of urgency, which can dovetail into even anxieties, um, and you know, easily aroused to, to anger or hostility. These are some things that can really push into that um, nervous system fatigue. Can you can you talk about that that mental side? You almost, you sort of mentioned that with one of the athletes there of having a good balance or mental state. Yeah, um, it's uh, that's a that's a tricky one because sure. it, in this sport, <laughs> it's um, that mindset is almost encouraged or mm. lauded because it gets you to a specific outcome. Um, 100%. <laughs> and that is what I always struggled with is just putting your hand up and saying, oh, hang on, uh, at what point does this become, you know, verging on pathological? And we all know that to become brilliant at something, you know, there is a little, there is an edge of, um, you know, psychological pathology, I guess, or, or um, I, I don't, you know, extremism. So, uh, <laughs> Um, I'm just trying to think of the best way to frame that. I've always put my hand up and said, well, look, hang on, you know, we should encourage people to have a little bit more balance in their life because, you know, what I see quite frequently is people doing a sport that's not paying them a salary for a reason. You know, yes, they might be quite good at it, but it's serving a purpose in their life, which often is one of distraction from you know, a number of issues which they probably should be dealing with because when you're training 16, 20, whatever hours a week, it's, there's no room for 
um, thinking about uh, other aspects of your life that you should be um, perhaps dealing with. For sure. So, uh, <laughs> so I saw a lot of that, and you know, I'd I'd encourage people to say, look, you know, that things will have to give if you want to be excellent at something. You know, other aspects of your life do give, but. As I said, I was always fascinated in the people that were able to achieve a degree of balance or psychological resilience. And, you know, working with a coach you trust, having a solid relationship, having a um, being quite goal orientated, but flexible seemed to be um, seemed to be something that that people like um, people like the athletes I mentioned had. the people that didn't do so well are the ones that become very obsessive about having to do something 100% of the time and beating themselves up if they didn't, you know, if they if they went out and they had a pizza, it was the end of the world and everything would go downhill from then. So reframing a little bit around, you know, being flexible in your approach um, to not just training but diet um, and relationships was was something that I tried to encourage in people, um, but it's difficult, as you said, because those personality types are are often the most rigid. Um, so, <laughs> That's, you know, interesting insights, and definitely something I see as well. Yeah, just having that find that middle ground, that flexibility, and sometimes for those folks doing less versus more. But um, if we circle all the way back to the biomarkers as well, you mentioned kind of tracking key biomarkers. If there's an athlete or coach listening in, you know, what are some biomarkers on the endurance athlete side of things that could be valuable for, you know, whether it's assessing training load or just just overall performance? Sure. So I actually started Curious 7 way back in 2012 because I, I found myself feeling fatigued and I couldn't find a service of us other than my NHS GP to do a blood test to kind of check where I was at and you know there's a few companies available allowing you to do cheap testing now so uh, I think these biomarkers are easier to track so the key ones are for me are you know your full blood count so your hemoglobin your red cell count your iron markers your ferritin your marker of iron storage which tends to deplete more in women than men but a lot of endurance trained men do have low ferritin unless they've got uh, a hemochromatosis gene and which allows them to store more iron gives them a genetic advantage so yeah full blood count iron thyroid markers so not just your tsh but looking at your free t free thyroxine and your free t3 uh vitamin d is increasingly important as we know um and getting to that sweet spot which we 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 see is correlated with improved performance and immunity is around the sort of 100 nanomoles per liter um and very given Um, different people take different dosing to get to that level depending on your uh, genetics and skin type Um, I also look at um, urinary hormones so I look at the Dutch test I use the Dutch test just because it's an easy way to track adrenal function and sex hormone function and downstream metabolism and that's an at-home test you do you pee on thick pieces of blotting paper and it gives you a, a readout of equivalent 24 hours of, of adrenal and sex hormone turnover so I use that a lot with athletes um, and again we do gut testing so looking at gut health markers your gut immunity presence of or you know presence of parasites any bacterial overgrowth um, uh, yeah and those are the main ones and also like Tommy and Nourish Balance Thrive his company they, we do organic acids tests as well to look at um, dysbiosis neurotransmitter levels um, yeast infections and, uh, um, and mitochondrial functions. So it's kind of a big mixing pot. But if you are only, you know, if, if you're not got major funds at your disposal, you know, just looking at your full blood count, thyroid, iron, vitamin D, and um, probably a morning cortisol and, and a DHEA um, alongside for men, to testosterone um, is, is, is really helpful, deep insight. Because what I mean, I can talk to you about the common patterns I see. Yeah, I think that'd be great to give an example of some of the thing again. Yeah, what's a common pattern of some of these markers that you might uh, encounter in practice? So we often see low red cells in men and women, um, unless they've been altitude, um, and that might be sort of runners sort of pseudo anemia because you get an increase in plasma volume as a as an effect of physical fitness. Um, but we look at look at the small the size of the cells, and sometimes that can indicate iron deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency, which are all common. 
Um, so that kind of borderline anemia is common. Low iron is common, men and women. Um, down-regulated thyroid function. So either two patterns where the TSH, so the brain control of your thyroid is actually tuned up. So the TSH is high. Um, that's a sign your brain is knocking on your thyroid saying, come on, you need to produce more thyroid hormone to keep up with metabolic demand, energetic demand. But often what we increasingly see is that the brain actually says, no, I'm not going to bother knocking on the thyroid's door because I've been trying to do that for years. And I'm, I'm, if I keep doing that, I'm going to trash the adrenals. So we see a flatlined TSH. So it might be at one, so normal. So your normal GP wouldn't pick it up. But you then have low levels of T4 and T3, the other thyroid hormones. Um, and at that sort of level, we I do support the thyroid with um, um, nutrients that we know that help thyroid function like selenium and and um, and zinc and other cofactors but you know for some people um but given that it's legal they do they do go on thyroid hormone supplementation so that's something that we also we do look at um obviously vitamin d and then as i mentioned we get into this picture of um sex hormone dysfunction so it's very common in in male endurance athletes to get uh, low lowered sex hormone function and I'm sure you've touched on this in, in your podcast before so morning testosterone levels and you should always measure your uh, testosterone within one to two hours of waking preferably one hour and that, that can be done by a finger prick blood test so it's nice and easy um, they drop usually we see a rise in something called sex hormone binding globulin which um is always seems to be up in, in endurance athletes as a sort of metabolic conservation uh, process whereby the body goes, right, you're not in a fit state to be reproducing. I'm going to put this SHBG up. So yep. you know, your, your effective <laughs> testosterone levels go down. Um, yeah, so I see that very commonly. I um, to Just to divert quickly, I, I did some testing on a, a professional cycling team and I was really interested by the patterns in some of these cyclists where they had high SHBG but they had super high total testosterone as well. And I thought this must be why they're good, you know, because they are, they're somehow their body has just tuned up both supplies. Um, whereas in more amateur athletes, I never see that. that. I would always see the you know, SHBG high in the data testosterone. Level. So I think there's a there's a genetic thing in there too, and obviously a supportive, um, a nutrient supportive role as well. But given that professional athletes can rest and eat better, Absol absolutely, it's definitely uh, that nuance between uh, investigating sort of genetically gifted elite or professional athletes versus the general pop. It's interesting to see what some things pop up there. Now you sort of mentioned this constellation of biomarkers and getting, getting a real clinical picture. If we shift gears to sort of some of the implementation, some of the solutions, I mean, obviously this is difficult because we're, we're talking in general terms, but again, some, some scenarios where on the, on the dietary front, you know, we mentioned the benefits of fats. What are some of the things people can think about if they feel like they're fitting into this, you know, overtraining or rundown picture? Um, I do like to see a, a picture because a, a, again, the overtraining picture always comes with adrenal dysfunction and knowing what that adrenal dysfunction is helps you know, with the with the with the approach in, in terms of what kind of nutraceuticals you'd use, what kind of adrenal um, support you'd use. But you know, for example, low cortisol, you're using you know licorice, rhodiola, and other things. Whereas high cortisol, you'd probably use ashwagandha and more calming ones. So knowing the clinical picture is is important. But you know, if we don't, if we just had no objective evidence, you know doing R and R, you know, taking time out, which is the hardest thing for some people, is, you know, the body's very good at self healing if you allow it and you give it space and rest. Um so obviously that's one thing that I encourage. I encourage people to do um, you know, to try and work on lifestyle factors, other stresses, sleep as as we know a big one. Yeah, great, um, great tip for coaches and docs listening in because oftentimes, yeah, these types of athletes need a prescription for rest to actually take it, right? Yeah, and I think it needs to. It definitely needs to be a prescription, and it needs to be time limited. Otherwise, it just becomes vague, and no athlete's going to do it. And you know, I've been guilty of that too, because you just get into this, you know, this hamster wheel of just getting up and training, and then you have to step back and say, "Well, actually, I'm not adapting. I'm doing all this training, but I'm not adapting and improving, and therefore really taking time back to taking time off to reflect and say, right, what do we need to change up here?" 
because you know the stimulus needs to be appropriate to cause the adaptation um so you know for me i learned that doing less but being more strategic about what i was doing actually resulted in better improvements uh a better performance improvements um so you know i think seeing the data is really helpful because you know a lot of people have been to their GPs and have had blood tests and they're like, well, there's nothing wrong with me. They just told me to rest. Um, but then when you start diving into the adrenal function, you really see where the problems lie um, and sex hormone function as well. So that's why I like to do things like the Dutch test. Um, but, Abs- you know, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. I was just going to jump holiday. in. Say, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Jump. I was going to say the sleep strategy is there in terms of, you know, whether it's a certain amount of hours a night, if it's if it's naps that you're encouraging people to take in, are there things, because obviously that recovery bucket is so wide, as you mentioned, are there certain things, or even if it's um, um, types of, um, you know, cold showers, um, uh, relaxing it pods, etc. If people do have a sleep problem, because obviously some people, when they've got adrenal issues, have sleep problems. So you can tell them to sleep all they like, they just can't. So they're up at like, you know, 2, 4 a.m. They're peeing in the night, which is, you know, classic adrenal dysfunction. So, you know, this you can start with the basics of, of sleep hygiene, as you know, and, you know, getting the blue light out in the evening, encouraging a sleep routine, you know, magnesium salts at night, um, you know, not looking at your phone, reading a book, all, the, all those strategies. Um, and then if they don't work, I use, you know, calming nutraceuticals, L-theanine, ashwagandha um, um, inositol or, or stacks around that 5-HTP I use quite frequently with some melatonin so depending on the level of sleep disturbance um, we, we address that but um, I also tell people you know that female hormone balance is, is specifically important with with sleep as well I see a lot of females in their late 30s who are you know going into early perimenopause because they've had periods of um, you know, this prolonged stress and the body just, you know, goes into early menopause and that's the hormonal fluctuations can cause sleep disturbance, um, night sweats. Um, so, you know, fixing fixing the hormones in those scenarios definitely helps fix the sleep, which then fixes the recovery, which, you know, everything upstream improves. Absolutely. And it's uh, like the graded approach there. I recently had uh, Dr. Amy Bender on as a sleep uh, researcher at uh, CSI, the Olympic Institute out west coast in Canada, and of course, you know, she reinforces the, the sleep hygiene and some of these things again to to reinforce with our athletes because, of course, it's like as you mentioned, it can kind of get boring or if we don't cue them up in the right way. But it's such a um, easy win for a lot of the recovery pieces. Now, if we circle back to supplements and just directly related to performance, endurance performance, were there any you know any things in particular that maybe that you used or that you you know encourage with some of your athletes to really just push on that performance edge if they are you know feeling recovered feeling good and, and really trying to reach the top of the podium um so more recently i've started to use um quite a few different things but niagen is one of them nad nicotinamide uh, riboside i use that with people do you know about that one yep yeah yep. obviously and um i use something called Mito PQQ, which is a combination of rhodiola and ubiquinol. Um, that seems to really help people. Those are sort of the more off-piece supplements. You know, the standards are your vitamin D, um, you know, appropriate iron if necessary, although I often stem away from all iron in endurance athletes because it upsets the gut and we go for intramuscular iron to get your ferritin iron storage protein up to around 70 to 100. Um, I use, you know, some really good quality multis, like thorn or pure encapsulations, designs for health that have a good blend. Um, and then, you know, depending on where they're at, magnesium, um, uh, re- um, ashwagandha, if they're, you know, your classic high stress types. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And then a- omega 3, sorry, omega 3 at a dose of around 3,000 milligrams uh, can really help people. Um, but often people don't get the dosing of these things right, as you know, and the timing um, specifically. So I, I, Super it, critical, I, absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. These are so many great insights here, Tams. And now if we shift gears a little bit to finish off, I want to be respectful of your time. Can you give listeners a little snapshot into your daily routine? Morning, are you a coffee person? Is it training first thing in the morning? Uh, how do you start your day? Sure. <laughs> um, I, how Tough would I question. like to start my day? Um <laughs> You know, back before I had a two-year-old or two and a half-year-old, it was it was a lot easier. But um, yeah, now I'm um, I, I 
I, I like to sleep into around eight, but I don't uh, often. And um, I get up, I try not to look at my phone for at least 10 minutes. Um, I always have um, either some hot water with lemon, but I usually have as well a licorice root tea because I find it helps really keep my, uh, give me a bit of a cortisol kick in the morning because we know the licorice prevents the, uh, can sustain cortisol levels in the system. Nice. Um, I then probably around four, up to half an hour, I then take two NAD, Nigen, um, and then I have a modified fatty coffee. Um, so I use a tablespoon of MCT oil and nicely brewed coffee and a tablespoon of collagen powder, hydrolyzed collagen powder, and a splash of full cream organic milk, and I blend that all up, and I have that. Um, and then I do the necessary childcare arrangements. I do a bit of stretching and then I do all my emails and um, then I will go for a bit of a run, usually just five to eight kilometers. And then I'll come home, have a smoothie, uh, which is usually a variation on Rhonda Patrick's smoothie. But I do use um, grass fed whey protein, goat whey. I use frozen fruits, um, sometimes throw some broccoli sprouts in there for the myrosinase, the uh, prostavane, and um, yeah, and that's fantastic. That's routine. Sounds, sounds like a great morning. Well, um, and obviously some days I'm just literally getting up and running out the door and going into London to work all day, but you know, generally. It's called intermittent fasting, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tamsin, really appreciate you taking the time out today. Where can people keep up with all your phenomenal work and where can people stay connected with you on social media? Um, so mostly on Twitter, I'm at Sporty Doc. I'm going through a rebrand at the moment back to my personal website, Dr. Tamsin Lewis, which will be up and running in, in probably around 10 days to two weeks. And we're launching a company called Fiber Health, 